Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to Smithsonian Video Webinars. My name is Maggie Benson, and I am a museum educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. We're going to give everybody a moment to join us um, in our room today before we go over a couple of logistics. So um, we do have a large audience already joining us. So we're so happy that all of you are um, able to join us today. All right, welcome everyone, welcome. All right, my name is Matt Benson. I'm a museum educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. On behalf of the museum, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which is inspired by our exhibit, Outbreak Epidemics in a Connected World. This is our first virtual program addressing the subject matter, and we're really happy that you could join us here for it. Now, before we begin, I want to be clear that this program is intended for adults. We've been doing a lot of programs for the um, student and the family audiences here at the Natural History Museum, but this program was created with our adult audience in mind. Now, today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Dennis Carroll, an expert with 15 years experience responding to infectious disease threats as part of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. After a brief presentation, Dennis will take a few questions from our moderator. Questions will be taken from the Q&A. So if you take a look on your screen, it's probably on the bottom or perhaps on the top. There's a button that says Q&A with two speech bubbles. And this is where you're going to submit your questions for Dr. Dennis Carroll to take after his presentation. Now we do have a lot of people in our program today, so we may not be able to get to all of them, but we will um, try to take as many as we can. If you submit a question there, just know that we at the Smithsonian can see your questions, but you may not see it pop up in the chat. We have um, a lot of people here today. Again, we're really happy you're here joining us. My name is Maggie and I'm connecting you to our um, expert, Dr. Dennis Carroll, and our moderator for today's program. Um, now, our moderator is Dr. Sabrina Schultz. Sabrina is a biological anthropologist at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum, and she studies connections between human, animal, and environmental health. She's also the curator of the Outbreak Exhibit at um, the museum right now. So welcome, Sabrina. Welcome, Dennis. We're so happy to have you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, so much. Okay. So welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you all here and to be part of this program today. As Maggie said, our first virtual program for the Outbreak Exhibit. Um, after more than two years of doing all of these events um, and engaging audiences in connection with the Outbreak Exhibit which opened in 2018 and is all about zoonotic viruses, emerging infectious diseases, and pandemic threats. So major global challenges that we faced then and before and never more so than today. The main message of Outbreak is One Health, that human, animal, and environmental health are all connected. But its secondary message is working together that it takes international and cross-disciplinary collaboration and coordination to prevent the global spread of pandemic threats. I was lucky to work together with many, many people on the Outbreak Exhibit, and our featured speaker today was one of them. Dennis Carroll played a crucial role as the advisor for the exhibit. We were talking more about it just before we went live, um, Dennis helped us with the training program for our amazing core of volunteers. Um, they've been having conversations with the public and has been the greatest supporter of the do-it-yourself version of Outbreak called Outbreak DIY, which has been used and translated and customized in hundreds of times in dozens of countries around the world. And so I can't tell you how much I have learned from Dennis over the years, and it just makes me so happy and excited to bring his expertise um, to you all today. So a bit about Dennis before he gets started. He has a PhD in biomedical research with a special focus on tropical infectious diseases from the University of Amherst, um, Massachusetts in Amherst. He was a research scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where he studied the molecular mechanics of viral infection. He that and received awards from CDC and USAID. Until last year, he was the director 
of USAID's Pandemic Influenza and Other Emerging Threats Unit. Uh, in that position, he led the Emerging Pandemic Threats Program, a global effort to combat new disease threats before they can become significant threats to human health. And as part of that program, he formed and oversaw projects like PREDICT, a decade-long initiative to detect and discover zoonotic viruses with pandemic potential and to build capacity and strength and surveillance for these threats worldwide. Currently, he serves as the chair of the leadership board for the Global Virome Project, which aims to discover and characterize the majority of our planet's unknown viral threats to human health and food security in the next 10 years. Uh, he is speaking to us from a boat, uh, living the best life, uh, and he is, I will note, um, a fantastic human being. So, Dennis, thank you again, and please take it away. Sabrina, thank you. Um, and thank all of you uh, for joining us today and uh, for welcoming us into your uh, bedrooms, living rooms, hallways, uh, wherever it is that people are sequestering themselves these days. Uh, as Sabrina noted, um, as part of the shelter in place uh, where we live in, I and my wife are living on a boat um, on the Potomac River in Washington. And if there's ever a place that you have to find yourself isolated, uh, being in a marina on a boat is as good as it gets. Um, hopefully, however, this will be something uh, sooner than later we will see in a rearview mirror. Uh, with that said, this discussion today about uh, pandemics uh, and the COVID-19 uh, virus and the pandemic associated with it is clearly timely. If I could have the first slide. Here we go. So it's, it's obviously an opportune time to be talking about what do we know about pandemics? And most importantly, what do we know about the ecology of emerging viral diseases? Where did the COVID-19 virus come from? And what are the implications um, as we move forward in the world today? I'm just going to talk briefly about those topics in the coming minutes, um, leaving most of the time uh, for uh, question and answers. Um, I will supplement um, my three PowerPoint slides uh, with a clip from the movie Contagion, uh, which I think will sort of highlight uh, in very graphic terms um, how a virus moves from a wildlife population into people and how a pandemic of the type we're experiencing now uh, can take hold. So why don't we begin with the first slide? We have heard from uh, different people uh, over the last several months that uh, the COVID-19 virus was a surprise. We didn't see it coming. Well, the truth of the matter is uh, many of us did see it coming. There was no surprise. And it really reflects, I think, a body of work that has been um, really spearheaded by um, partners and coalitions from the uh, conservation, wildlife, public health uh, community uh, around the world over the last several decades. And what we know about emerging diseases like COVID-19 virus is really quite substantial. The most important piece of information though that we should uh, sort of highlight is that the COVID-19 virus is and was not a surprise. Uh, the fact of the matter is this virus um, didn't just appear. Uh, it has been circulating in wildlife populations, um, in bats, uh, for decades. And that its sudden emergence in human population uh, is really a direct consequence of the way we live on this planet. What we know about pandemic viruses is that there are really three stages. The first, if you look at the bottom of the graphic, is the circulation of their natural host within wildlife populations. Um, wildlife animals have acted as a reservoir for novel viruses uh, for eons. And it's only been with the increased uh, disruption of the um, our population on the planet, 
that we see that there is a sequential process of spillover of viruses uh, from wildlife into domestic animals, think of avian influenza, or directly into people, think of uh, HIV AIDS. And what we see is that as we have a pre-emergence period uh, where viruses are circulating in wildlife, uh, we then have, uh, with the spillover event, um, it's beginning to circulate in localized human populations. And then uh, progressively, it begins to move out by way of global travel and become a pandemic. Uh, the next slide. What we know that the emergence, the spread and amplification of these dangerous viruses, however, is not an accident. It's really a direct consequence of a combination of what we know about the biologic risk, the very specific features a virus has, both in terms of its, uh, how easily it can adapt to a new ecosystem, how readily it can move from one host to a new host, uh, and also what it says about how impactful it is on that new host, to what extent it causes diseases. Um, that is really reflective of the biologic risk associated with different viruses. COVID-19 virus, very much like its very close cousins, uh, the MERS virus and SARS virus, have shown themselves uh, very uh, adaptable uh, to Homo sapiens, that they've been able to move from animal populations into human populations, and as we've seen with each of these viruses, cause severe illness and death. But we also know that that spillover event uh, is not really a consequence of the virus, it's really a consequence of the way we behave. Viruses don't spill over or don't spread. We enable a virus to spill over and spread by the way we interact with the um, ecosystems around us. And as we've moved to a population of 8 billion people, the one thing we know with certainty is that our interaction with wildlife and the ecosystems that uh, support wildlife are increasingly becoming more dynamic and impactful. And as a direct result of that, as we move further into the 21st century, this combination of biologic risk and behavior risk is going to result in intensification of spillover events with new novel viruses uh, causing epidemics and pandemics with a greater frequency than we've ever seen in human history before. So unfortunately, as we think about the century we're living in today, COVID-19 as SARS, as MERS, as Ebola are really a preview into a world where these risks are becoming more common uh, part of our landscape. Last slide. But when we think about spillover, and we think about the interactive dynamics between people and the wildlife populations around us, one thing that we need to appreciate is that the whole world is not at equal risk of driving this spillover event forward. There are, based on an extraordinary body of work carried out by colleagues uh, around the world, a, a clearer understanding that there are hotspots, places where population pressures from um, our own settlements and the convergence with mammalian diversity are really critical factors that are transforming the dynamics of spillover, amplification, and spread of these new viruses. So as you look at the map on this slide, there increasingly is an understanding that there are certain hotspots, places where people wildlife, domestic animals, and the ecosystems are interacting in such a dynamic, combustible way that the uh, opportunity for spillover and spread of new viruses is enhanced. This is, on the one hand, uh, an important observation because it allows us to begin thinking about where we need to focus our efforts because spillover events, they are an unintended consequence of the way we live 
And as a result, they have the opportunity to be um, prevented. These are not um, God-ordained events. They are a direct consequence of the way we live, and we can be more thoughtful, and we can be more proactive in paying closer attention to how disruptive um, our footprint is on this planet, and we can better manage our relationship and interaction uh, with the ecosystems and animal populations around us. Fundamentally, there should never again be a COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemics are preventable, epidemics are preventable. And if we pay closer attention to how we live, we can uh, be much more effective at minimizing the opportunities for these spillover events to happen. Ultimately, it's up to us to prevent, uh, and we can do that um, if we work together as a global community. With that said, I'd like to sort of introduce um, a short video. It's one minute and 15 seconds long. And for those of you who have seen the movie Contagion, um, this is the opening or closing scenes within that movie, where we see graphically illustrated the moment when a dangerous virus circulating in a bat population spills over into an intermediary livestock pig population, uh, which subsequently uh, spills over into a human population. You see graphically presented here the dynamic interface between wildlife, people, uh, and the ecosystem. It opens up with the disruptive uh, impact of bulldozers knocking down a forested area to build a swine uh, farm. And you see subsequently a uh, bat uh, interact with the swine population in a way that allows for a spillover event uh, to move through the swine and ultimately the human population. You can see each of the steps uh, that occur are steps that can be prevented. So look at this slide, look at the video. It's a really uh, excellent uh, example. And quite frankly, it's drawn from a real world example. It was modeled after the 1999 Nipah outbreak in Malaysia involving bats, Nipah virus, pig farm, and uh, local farmers. And so what you see here is an, really a clear example of what the world we're living in is begetting. Take a look. Afterwards, we'll have a chance for some questions and answers. Look forward uh, to chatting with you. We can begin the slide. Thank you, Dennis. That was great. I always like to see that scene. And I think that was a really nice summary of some of the very important, good information that you just shared with us. You know, watching that film Contagion, that was made in 2011, I believe, or at least that's when it was released. And so that was uh, after, uh, not too long after, one of these projects that I mentioned um, that you oversaw and helped to create um, called PREDICT began, right? And I think that that scene reflects some of what the problems 
that PREDICT was trying to address. Could you tell us more about that project and what your role was in it? Sure. Um, first off, it's worth noting that uh, uh, a number of the individuals involved in PREDICT were technical advisors uh, on this film. So uh, a nice example of bringing real life experience uh, to Hollywood and having, and having it honestly portrayed. Um, yeah, and, and I, will, I will say that uh, Nipah is also one of the featured stories, one of the featured diseases in the outbreak exhibit. Uh, we talk about Malaysia as well as Bangladesh, and we had so many of the members of the PREDICT consortium involved in our experts and stakeholder group as well. So good storytelling, yes. No, absolutely. And of, of course, I always feel sorry for Gwyneth Paltrow um, at the end. Obviously, yeah. she becomes uh, um, the uh, index case that spreads this virus around the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Couldn't wait for her to have to carry for the rest of her life, knowing that she essentially decimated the world's population. Yeah, and there were so many decisions and steps along the way that were, I guess, beyond her control immediately. But as yeah. you're saying, we're all involved in uh, preventing them. To answer your question, Sabrina, you know, yeah. it, it really was. Uh, uh, you know, we launched that in 2009. It was after uh, four years of. Uh, responding to avian influenza. And we were opening up the gauge after focusing on uh, avian influenza. The larger question was, uh, what can we learn about the larger um, body of potential viral threats beyond influenzas? What could we learn about coronaviruses? What could we learn about filoviruses, the family that involves Ebola and Marburg? or flavy viruses, the Zikas and the Dengue viruses of the world. And PREDICT was really an investment in viral discovery. And one, trying to understand how um, practical it was. Could we really go out in a systematic way and do the kind of documentation about where viruses were circulating, what their host uh, populations were, and what were some of the behaviors that propelled a virus to jump from a wildlife population into humans. And PREDICT, uh, quite frankly, was an enormously successful um, project. It provided a level of insight um, that really helped us think much more carefully about you know, what the world needs to be doing in order to better prepare and prevent these threats in the future. And it really became a critical proof of concept for thinking about how operating at scale, if we began to categorize, characterize, and understand viruses when they were still circulating in wildlife before they jumped to us, how we could use that information uh, to better prevent spillover events from happening in the first place. As I said, they're a direct result of us. So what could we learn about what it is that we're doing and prevent these events from happening. But if they did happen, what could we do to use um, a much deeper understanding of viruses and viral genetics to develop new countermeasures, new vaccines, new pharmaceuticals, diagnostics, take advantage of gene editing and CRISPR-Cas to totally transform um, the way we respond to future viral threats. So, PREDICT laid the foundation for what, as you noted, uh, the work on the Global Virome Project, about taking PREDICT to a global scale, but in the vision of a global partnership. Not a USAID project, but a project owned and run and uh, directly benefiting uh, the global community. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it really is global versus, uh, uh, PREDICT was worldwide, certainly. I think you operate in 30 countries, but also focusing on those hot spots, right? Taking that approach to um, the particularly, um, I guess, uh, um, interesting, but also um, concerning areas where you had uh, those interactions that you're talking about. Yeah. Where really could become an outbreak that spreads. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, you know, learning so much about what, what so many people you know, working um, around the world did for PREDICT. I think it was, how many viruses, new viruses were discovered? 
predict? Well, they, they did two things. One, they discovered about 1,200 new viruses. But yeah. more importantly, through that viral discovery, they were able to help us quantify what that viral dark matter, how much uh, virus, how many viruses are circulating in wildlife that we really have to be thinking about. Um, and what they helped us understand is that there are about 1.6 million, of which about 600 the viruses and, and otherwise, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe 600,000 may have a potential to infect uh, people, but a much smaller percentage of that could have some adverse effect. Most microbes that infect us were totally oblivious to. They have no impact whatsoever. But what it underscored, Sabrina, is that if we're really going to get ahead of future viral threats, and there's 1.6 million of them, and if we, um, through knowing them in greater detail, uh, predict with too small a scale, at 1,200 viruses over 10 years, we really needed to elevate this partnership. And in 10 years, really be able to develop a comprehensive viral global atlas um, that would transform our ability to prevent, detect, and respond uh, to future viral threats. Yeah, and uh, as, as people should know, PREDICT ended last year. And I guess another question is how much of that work is still continuing, either through the Global Virome Project or elsewhere in other ways? Okay. Well, oh, PREDICT no was longer doing any of this. Right. PREDICT was scheduled to end uh, September uh, 2019. Uh, yeah. It's been extended, um, I believe, until uh, the end of this uh, September of oh, okay. uh, to be able to do some of the analytic work. Um, yeah. okay. really wrap up. Um, there is some uh, concern that has been expressed about USAID's um, backing away from viral discovery. Um, I would hope that the uh, experience with COVID-19 pandemic underscores the singular importance about being proactive, going to the viruses before they come to us, and that we will uh, see um, USAID and the U.S. government step forward in the near future to commit itself to joining a global effort to really um, bring into focus what these future threats look like and how we can use that insight um, to better uh, make the world safe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to questions from our audience in just a minute, but I have one more myself. Uh, you said repeatedly, I wrote it down, that it was no surprise what's happened uh, with COVID-19. Is there anything uh, about this pandemic that has surprised you? Uh, well, as I said, I'm not surprised about uh, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, it's predictable. It's very much uh, in lines with what you would expect from a near cousin to SARS and MERS. Mm -hmm. What I am, um, quite frankly, gobsmacked about uh, is the uh, total absence of a global response. Uh, in my 30 years of doing global health work, uh, I have never seen a situation where an event that is global in nature has seen such a fragmentation of how the world has responded uh, to this problem. It's been every country for themselves. And uh, it's, it's really, quite frankly, disheartening. Um, the work that we did for avian influenza, the work that we did in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, the Ebola West Africa epidemic, they were all uh, examples of the global community coming together and working as a community to effectively respond to those challenges. And what we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic is a absolute fragmentation of those global networks, those global partnerships. And in some ways, it's no surprise. The rise of populism in our own country, across Europe, elsewhere in the world, essentially America first, UK first, every country seeing themselves operating independently um, has created a space for a virus to move much more 
um, uh, impactfully around the world. And it has just shown just how vulnerable we are when we don't act as a global community. So I'm stunned by the lack of a global response. And quite frankly, I remain enormously alarmed at the silence of the global communities addressing the needs of those populations and countries in the world that are far more fragile than our own health systems or the health systems of Europe and what the impact of this virus is going to look like when it begins moving much more aggressively across uh, not just Africa, but across all of those millions of people that are displaced, uh, living in camps, uh, living uh, on the edges of society. How are they going to be um, protected from uh, this scourge? The silence of the global community to me is deafening. And that to me is the, that is what surprises me. It's not the biology, it's the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, thank you for that, Dennis. Um, you know, it's, it's it, the way that you can, uh, I think, articulate these problems, these really big problems um, so well is really helpful for a lot of people, certainly for our audience. And they've got a few more questions for you. So I'm going to go to these uh, and we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. Okay. Uh, first question. You to talk very quickly then. <laughs> okay. As much time as you need. I mean, you've got you've just leak knowledge, Dennis. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, it's it's always always learning so much. Okay. Haven't humans and animals always interacted dynamically with each other? Is there anything different now um, than in the past that make these viral diseases more likely? I think that you you spoke to this, but maybe you want to um, reemphasize. Let me, let me reemphasize, yes, we've always interacted. Um, and in fact, if you look back at many of the infectious diseases that are endemic in the human population today, uh, their origins were zoonotic, malaria, tuberculosis. Those were all at one point or another zoonotic diseases. The difference is 8 billion people soon to translate into almost 12 billion people. The frequency and the intensity of the interaction, that's what's changing. Not that we haven't interacted before, but it's a bit like the difference between going into a subway at midnight and getting on a subway train. You know that you've got the car largely to yourself, but if you go into a subway train during rush hour, you know your interactive, bumping into other people will happen with much greater frequency. We're essentially um, speeding across a subway line at 5 p.m. in the evening in rush hour, elbow to elbow. That's the world we live in today. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good imagery. You've used traffic metaphors before, Dennis. I think they're really effective um, in the way we not only need to recognize risk, but also manage that risk. Um, all right, so this next question I know is one that, that you've spoken to, uh, spoken to quite a bit. Um, it's really important. What is the role of livestock farming intensification, specifically in all of this? Would intensive farming increase the risk of such spillovers or reduce it given higher biosecurity measures in intensive modern farms? Right. Well, there's a double-edged sword aspect with uh, livestock. On the one hand, as we've seen with avian influenza, um, uh, poultry populations raised under poor, low biosecurity. That is, um, viruses off a farm can easily move onto the farm. We've seen that poultry act as a great amplifier and further conduit for moving the viruses uh, around the world and allowing it to further evolve and um, sort of acquire uh, new dangerous features. But there's also, so biosecurity will really lower that risk and make um, the opportunity for livestock to act as a uh, uncontrolled intermediary. Uh, we can bring that under control. But there's another uh, element to livestock production. And if you remember on the third slide when I talked about hotspots, and we talk about 
what are the big drivers behind hotspots? One of the single biggest predictors for where um, a hotspot will occur is land use change, where we see the, uh, the destruction of uh, traditional uh, forest ecosystems that um, act as the natural uh, habitats for wildlife. La essentially, land uh, looking at the disruptive effect on landscape is the biggest single predictor. Uh, there was a report that uh, came out from the UN a year ago, and basically that report uh, underscored that land use change uh, is the, not just the single biggest predictor for zoonosis, it's also one of the biggest drivers behind climate change. Um, as knocking down uh, forest canopies is dramatically altering atmospheric gases. But most importantly, what we're seeing is that livestock act as the biggest driver for propelling ecosystems to collide between human populations and wildlife. And cattle in particular um, account for 75% of all land use change dynamics that are occurring in the world. And I might add, cattle also um, essentially account for about 20% of all methane gases released in the air. So you see that both the rise or emergence of zoonosis um, and climate change have a shared um, sort of driver, land use change, and livestock is the single biggest driver behind that. So in some way, we need to be much smarter about how we produce animal protein. Cattle is the biggest contributor. If you compare cattle uh, impact on land use change versus um, pigs or mm -hmm. chicken, uh, it's mm -hmm. remarkably different. They account for about a tenfold larger um, land um, scape impact. So as we go forward and we think about people's access to animal protein, incredibly important, and we think about food security, uh, we need to be a lot smarter about how we produce uh, animal um, livestock populations and how we can do it in a way that minimizes the impact on land use and as a consequence reduces the risk of uh, spillovers from wildlife and um, the collateral impact on climate change, a, a shared inner space. Solve one problem, we get rid of two. Yeah, that's great. And, and how we place demands on that animal protein, right? And uh, the policies and uh, processes we support is, I think, really critical in thinking about how we can prevent and reduce these risks. We have time for one more question, um, and it's a two-part question, all right? But uh, it's related, and it's it's um, touching on some of what you were speaking about um, concerning spillover in particular, and these interfaces, this collision that we're talking about. Um, one, so how does a virus present itself in its animal hosts? Um, I think maybe we're talking about a reservoir, for example, or an intermediate host. Are the animals sick? And then the second part, um, which I think is very good, and I was going to ask as well, what is the mechanism for the jump in humans? We hear about this jumping all the time, but as you pointed out very well, I mean, it's, it's really us that are doing it, you know, not the virus moving itself. Um, is the animal shedding, uh, host shedding the virus, which then the humans catch, for example? Okay, well, let's, let's deal with the last question and I'll go back to the video. What we saw in the video was a bat uh, that was obviously, uh, for purposes of the story, uh, infected um, with a very dangerous virus. And when a bat sheds the virus, it can shed the virus in a couple of ways. One, through its saliva um, and through its feces and urine um, it, or through its blood, if you consume the bat. Uh, in the video, what we saw was the bat um, eating a banana um, bats have a sweet tooth, and they like to eat uh, sweet things, and drop the banana covered with its own saliva. And the pig that ate that 
banana, consume not just the banana, but consume the viruses that were on the surface of the banana. And essentially, the virus entered into uh, the pig. That was a spillover, a jumping from the bat into the pig. So that's an example. Um, we could go to Ebola, and we can think about the West Africa Ebola epidemic of 2014. And when you go back and you look for the index case, where did this epidemic begin? All evidence points to a small village in the forests of uh, Guinea and a particular child, uh, Emmanuel, who was about four years old and was playing in the nook of a tree that was roosted, a, a roost area for bats and they defecated onto the ground. And that little boy pr presumably became exposed by way of the feces, bat feces on the ground, um, became infected. And that became the process of his parents caring for him. They became infected. Their family caring for the parents became infected. And soon the entire village uh, was infected and thus began the West Africa epidemic of 2014. Mm -hmm. So those are two examples of spillover, um, where a virus is shed from the wildlife animal into people. Um, and a third, if I might, because this is virtually the yes. 100th yes. anniversary, if you will, a bad anniversary that it might be, for the beginning of the HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, retrospectively, uh, it is uh, presume that the epidemic began uh, in uh, Cameroon around 1920, 1921, 22, and in all likelihood involved a hunter who uh, killed and slaughtered a uh, non-human primate, a rhesus monkey, a chimpanzee. Um, and in the process of slaughtering that animal, and non-human primates are a food source, uh, in this case, uh, became exposed to the blood of that particular primate. And in the blood of that primate was the precursor to the human uh, immunodeficiency virus, the simian immunodeficiency virus. And that, um, that virus made a jump by way of um, entering into presumably a wound or some uh, such thing on the hunter, that hunter, um, then became infected with the simian variant. That simian variant adapted to that hunter's um, system and yes. thus began a 60-year uh, journey that yeah. was not recognized till 1980. And by then, we had a global pandemic. Those are three examples um, to answer that question. Yeah, and I, I do think that's important. Um, it can be hard, I think, for people who are not experts um, to um, conceptualize, to really understand how that transmission can occur and often does occur. The animals aren't, aren't coughing, right? I mean, often it's, it's not the kind of sickness that we think of that can um, you know, uh, contribute to human-to-human -human transmission. Yeah. Right? They, 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 they have evolved um, in many cases uh, with these microbes their partners with them in evolutionary sense, um, and therefore they're not sickened by them, right? They can carry them. And because we have one more minute and we're on this topic, um, one I wanna, I wanna wrap it up, bring you back to COVID-19. And I think another topic that a lot of people are reading about and curious about, talking about COVID-19 in other animals now, um, and possibly infections coming from us. Is that right? I mean, how can we understand these uh, reports that um, we're seeing about COVID-19 or the virus, I guess we should say, the cause yeah. of COVID-19 in tigers, at zoos, in cats, in houses, in minks, um, uh, on farms and the like? In, in, in what? In, I'm sorry. Oh, um, sorry. With, with the COVID-19 virus, um, it seems that maybe we are actually passing it um, to other animals. Is that well, right? That was originated in a wildlife. The, the arrows so, of transmission move in both directions. We're just one other species. And yeah. so when we, when we are infected with a virus, um, uh, 
we're just as likely to shed that virus and uh, infect another species. There's nothing special about us in this whole process. Um, so we've, we have seen examples of you know, human hepatitis um, infecting uh, uh, gorilla populations in Rwanda, um, that the arrows of transmission can move in uh, both directions. So um, it should come as no surprise that there's an opportunity as we um, shed this virus that other opportunities for this virus, it's, it's fundamental sort of Darwinian directive is diversify its species. That's it. And yeah. the more ecologic niche, every, every new species is ensuring that if one species goes extinct, it will still survive in another species. It's a brilliant survivalist strategy. And it's worth noting, you know, Elon Musk is trying to do exactly the same thing by saying we have to become interplanetary species because at some point an asteroid is going to wipe out this planet and we're singularly dependent on this planet for us. So in some way, viruses are, have a, a leg up on us in terms of understanding. Survival goes to the most diversified uh, host range. Uh, and so that's all. So we, yeah, that is, that is great, great uh, yeah. <laughs> to leave us with <laughs> Elon <laughs> as big as possible. And I love it. Um, I, 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 every time I speak with you, I feel um, a lot more knowledgeable. And I, I have to say, I'm a bit more empowered with that knowledge, to maybe make better decisions, um, and certainly approach, you know, these questions um, and these issues. And, and let me just say, power is knowledge. So the more yeah. we understand the story of COVID-19 virus, where it came from, how it's moving, and how we can eventually get rid of it, that should empower us to make sure we never have a COVID-24, a COVID-28. We should never be faced with these um, events again in the future. Knowledge is power. That's right. Well, thank you. Dennis, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, this concludes our very first Outbreak virtual program. Um, so thanks to everyone who is yep. here to join us. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, we are gonna have our second virtual program two weeks from now, coming up on May 12th. Um, it's gonna feature the medical historian, Mark Honigsbaum. Okay, and he actually had his book here on my table, I think. I wrote um, New Pandemic, century, this pandemic century, the pandemic century. And um, also, uh, yeah, he is going to compare and contrast 1918 Spanish flu uh, with the current pandemic. And so you can register for that program um, at the Natural History Events webpage that is linked in the chat. And so after this webinar ends, um, everyone is going to see a survey pop up asking for some feedback uh, about the program. Please take a moment. Uh, to respond. We're really interested in hearing what topics you might want to see for future programs and what you thought about this one. So thank you again for attending everyone. Uh, stay healthy and be well. Bye.